Thanks for joining me for another Blunt Business on CannabisRadio.com. Really appreciate all of you joining us. If you haven't done so, if you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so. Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and please rate and review the show. And, of course, you can find all of our programming, CannabisRadio.com. A very interesting episode for you today. As I get to learn about the lead author of a paper that was recently published in Addiction, and it's research that focuses specifically on the California retail cannabis market, examining purchasing trends and product preferences among young adults ages 21 to 24, and compared them to their older counterparts, ages 25 plus, and this is from the period between 2018 and 2021. So here with me to go and talk about this, an expert in consumer behavior, professor of marketing with University of California, Irvine's Paul Mirage School of Business, and she is the lead author, as I said, of the said paper we're going to talk about today, Professor Connie Peshman. Thank you for being on with us, Connie. I appreciate you being on. Thank you for inviting me. It's important. I've always said when we can go ahead and put proof positive studies that are out there to understand what the cannabis market is and with the reputation of those that are from the academic or scientific sectors. So the idea of putting this together, I mean, talk to me first of all about what UC Irvine has done so far. Is there anything in terms of research or, you know, how entrenched into studying the cannabis market has the school been and what you've been able to go ahead and do yourself that led to this paper? So one of the particular centers you have right now on campus is the UCI Center for the Study of Cannabis. And there's a lot of things you're doing right now where you, you know, for instance, have, have gotten a chance to get work with the Bureau of Cannabis Control in California to, research, to receive grants from the Bureau to the area of $1.3 million to do research. So I know about UC Davis having that a few years back, and there were various areas where you know, you have, from the year of 2021 to 2022, you had that much been able to go and put together. So that was part of this year where initially this grant money was being used to be able to do studies like this, which was the California Healthy Kids Survey and also studying cannabis market sales, how products appeal to youth, evolving from 2017 to 2021. So this is not just the first, uh, it's the first, not the first of many, but of many that you've already done down the line. And when it comes to what I've seen from other universities in California and what they've been able to do in terms of being able to go and do the level of research that they've been able to do, that it's been difficult, I imagine, to be able to have the product available that's not going to be perished, that's going to be available to go and use to actually test and actually research what's going on with cannabis and the effects of it. So what talk to me about you know what you've been able to do with the BCC, the grant money, and what you've been able to get in terms of resources to be able to put out studies like this. So we got the first grant from the uh, Department of Cannabis Control in California. That was the first grant year. Um, and we did not have to buy cannabis and give it to people we arranged to get the data from these retailers who already provide the data to a marketing research firm called Headset. Uh, so all we did was we uh, we got this enormous data set that showed all the sales in all these retail stores for multiple years, every single week, every single month, every single SKU, right. every single product. Um, and we just looked at who was buying them because the many of the people buying had loyalty cards and from the loyalty card, you knew their age. So we didn't have to deal with a problem where you can't get permission to use the product to give to human subjects. That's a very unfortunate problem. I hope it's resolved. Um, but we, uh, were just looking at legal sales. Right. So we were, it was much easier for us to do our research. And has said, we've talked to quite a bit here on the program, here in our Blunt Business series. We know they do great reports. We know they're very expansive and they do a lot, especially with California, among others that are out there. But the one thing I always notice going back, I want to say it was 2018 when I remember talking to someone about how they were able to get a grant for UC Davis. 
And what the issue was, was the amount of product they were to go ahead and get to build to use because of issues like the hemp bill and in terms of what level of research could be done because of obtaining or possessing cannabis at the time it was being done. Has there been anything where what you've been going to do in terms of is there cultivation being done right now at the time? Or is it just taking what's being harvested and researching it? Like what level of the cultivation process is being done on campus or is it just being received and being tested? On our campus, to my knowledge, we aren't doing anything like that. So that's more of a Davis uh, issue. Right. right. Uh, because they're agricultural school. We're not. Okay. So we have a big business school and a big school of public health. So we collaborated and what we did was epidemiology research, which simply looks at the behavior once the product is out on the market. So not uh, so basically who's buying it, what they're buying, changes in what they're buying, what are the prices that they're paying. So it's much more of a marketing study. And what you've done in terms of research over the last few years, and then we're going to get to the point about the study that you put out, that you've done research about the effects of cannabidiol and A9 uh, TEC on driving performance on when it comes to neuropsychiatric symptoms among uh, older adults and what is done in terms of fear extinction, attenuated stress responses, among other things. There's a lot of different trials and a lot of the things that have been shown, double blind, placebo controlled, randomized, adaptive trials, all these various things that you've done right here. And I feel like you know, it's, I'm surprised I haven't heard much about it. And it's like, when you want to get policymakers, you want to get the people that should be reading these research papers and these studies and seeing them up front, has it been difficult to get this out there and get it exposed to the public? I don't think so. Well, first of all, as researchers, we want to get it out into the journals as soon as possible. So uh, if you see, like, I submitted the paper in November, it's already published, you know, several months later. Uh, the journals are quite receptive. Addiction is one of the top journals in the country or in the world, actually. Right. So, And they published a lot, actually. Uh, the problem is uh, getting the funding and getting the approvals uh, to to give cannabis to human subjects and to study them. That is is difficult with any kind of medical research. Uh, it requires a lot of oversight and a, like a, a health panel to review the medical effects and make sure no one is seriously harmed in the study. Uh, so those kinds of studies are taking a lot longer to get out just because of oh, the sure. bureaucracy involved in general. So the ones you're seeing out, the studies you're seeing out are the ones which are using the retail data because we've been using retail data to study sales for decades, you know, like who's buying, uh, like how, you know, people respond to high low prices versus everyday low prices, you know, or, you know, do they like store brands or do they like name brands or under what circumstances? That's just been studied for decades. And we know how to do that. There's no permission involved because the data, the people are anonymous. The data is anonymous. So we don't even have to go through any human subjects permission processes we could just do the studies and publish so if you look at journals like addiction they're publishing mostly the retail data right now right and that's simply seeing what people are buying in and like is potency increasing or decreasing our prices increasing or decreasing or a package size changes things that can be observed at the retail level and unfortunately the things that you're describing uh, are just going to take longer the researchers want to get it out the journals want it we just, uh, yeah, we're just slowed down because of you know human subjects concerns. And also- oh, but I mean, I'm looking on the site, Professor. There's so much you've done here. It's, I mean, it would take me hours to go through. And obviously, when it talks about years that you've actually done all this work, because that's the best part. The grant money that's been brought in for the last few years to do all this research, especially also during the pandemic times, that there's all these wonderful studies that you've done to show promise to show actual positive effects of cannabis when used, you know, whether it's for medical or adult use. The idea is that this research, where I'm coming from with that question was, is that I wanted to break the narrative of what your mainstream media will go ahead and depict as big weed or marijuana 
and how they want to continue to go ahead and bash and discredit the real benefits of cannabis. Stay tuned. We have more Blunt Business coming up after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back to Blunt Business. I'm here with Professor Connie Peshman, Professor of Marketing with University of California, Irvine's Paul Mirage School of Business. You're an accredited school. You, I mean, it's, for me, I want to say this is what the kind of research we've had. We don't talk about it enough. And unfortunately, I'm guilty of this as well for not looking more into seeing who has been doing the research out here. But I'm so happy that you have been able to get to us so we can talk about it. The thing is, I just want this where there's overwhelming research. We have it here. But it's also be something where there is no choice. But then all media sources now need to go ahead and start bending the knee and basically saying, listen, we've been talking wrong about cannabis. We need to retract what we were saying about it. All these opinion editorial pieces, they're not based on facts at all. Meanwhile, you are. Yes, I agree. I think research needs to be used. One area where there has been quite a bit of research is on uh, nerve pain. And there's been what's called a meta-analysis, meaning enough studies that you could actually do a summary of the studies. And that shows that there's a significant improvement in nerve pain, certain types of nerve pain with medical marijuana. So that's one example where there's been enough research that there's even a definitive what we call meta-analysis that concludes all across all these studies that there's a positive effect for use of marijuana, medical marijuana for nerve pain. But those are, that's the only one I've been able to find. Uh, But it's just going to take time. Uh, It's great that California provides money because basically we can't do this research without money. We can't do it. So Washington state provides money. California provides money. Federal government doesn't provide money to the, to my knowledge. Right. I'm not but sure. With all but the money that excise taxes and all and everything that California taxes, you know, pretty aggressively on the market, but where it's worth, I'm glad to see that the money is being made it to is, is making it to institutions like yours. So that's so I want to make the point that, you know, even though I might go after California a little bit because they do tax so much per square inch, per square foot, for everything, and if it's not a state, a local excise tax, or whatever there is, at least I know that the well, here's proof positive that the grant money is from tax dollars being put towards this because these businesses are actually getting the chance to reinvest into something that's very important, like what you're doing. So, into the story about the survey that you have done here through addiction that's been published in addiction is, you know, and you know, when I look at what you have here, I'm not surprised by some of the numbers where. Flower and vapor pens have appealed mostly to young adults based on absolute dollar sales, dominating young adult spending compared with other cannabis products, and that vapor pen and concentrates appeal to young adults based on dollar share ratios and comprising a 52% greater share of younger adult cannabis spending relative to the older demographic and less appealing for adults, young adults for pre-rolls, edibles, averages, and assumable products. Actually, that's the part that's actually surprising is that Younger adults were not interested in edibles so much. I thought that would be much higher. And they're not big on to, you know, consumables or drinks or sorbables. Are you surprised by that? I was definitely surprised. I think that's one of the biggest surprises because people assume young people are going to like the gummies and the drinks. Not true. So, I mean, we're starting at age 21, right? These are legal buyers of recreational marijuana. So we're not looking at 13-year-olds, 11-year-olds, or even 15-year-olds. We don't know what they're doing. That's illegal. So, of course, retailers aren't going to record any sales to them. (laughs) I'll tell you what, uh, uh, Professor, I think maybe part of the thing would be that I know edibles have gone through quite a bit of change in terms of distillation, you know, in terms of solventless technology. So it could be that just some of the products that might have made it to market so far, they might have still had like maybe a bit of a that aftertaste or things like that. But meanwhile, one of the things that when it comes to vape pens and cartridges is the fact that, well, flowers really grow well in California. We know that everybody can talk about the Humboldt Triangle, the Emerald Triangle, or Humboldt County, and all these different areas that grow great flower for years. But also with the vape pens, you know, there's a big change that there was a transition when we saw that, you know, the issues of the vape crisis that we had in 2018 and that change over where people were definitely making that transition away from 
jewel-flavored nicotine-based e-cigarettes and converting more into cannabis. In the study that you saw there, how much did you see that of that change? Because obviously in that 2018 to 2021 range, that was definitely when you saw the conversion. So what we saw in a, a prior paper that I didn't talk to you about that was published sure. in the Cannabis Journal, we found that when that vape scare occurred, everyone stopped using cannabis vape. And actually, many of the problems were with cannabis vape, but it was because, you know, those were bad cannabis vapes, not because cannabis vape itself is dangerous. Probably the products. The, the, the actual the, products were poorly correct. manufactured. So what happened was adults permanently uh, reduced their use of cannabis vape, whereas young people bounced back. Mm -hmm. So uh, and sales of vape are uh, increasing faster with young people than with older adults. So young people have turned to vape for nicotine. They older adults still smoke cigarettes. Younger people are smoking nicotine vape, and younger people are increasingly um, using nicotine uh, cannabis in in vape form. What's also interesting is that in the conclusion to the study, that younger adults they were spending more other more on vape pens and concentrate, but also with a preference to high potency of delta nine THC. So synthetics more than organic yes that we don't know why people bought this we just know they did but in in general with regard to edibles too the other research that's been done where they've interviewed kids has has shown that young adults want a quick reliable high because they're usually with friends and they're partying and so they're not like you know trying to relax after dinner and go to sleep or reduce pain because they have some chronic pain issue where they would use edibles. Instead, they want a quick high. So just like they would take shots of alcohol, you know, to get quickly high on alcohol, they want a quick high from marijuana, from cannabis. So they don't want to use edibles because it takes too long. It just takes too long for, for it to kick in. They want it, you know, they want to feel high in one second. <laughs> And that's why they like the high potency, too, because it's uh, faster. That's fascinating. I would imagine part of the reason for that would be the amount of head shops that are out there, the amount of stores, convenience stores that are able to go and still get away with selling Delta 9. And I'm not saying anything bad about it. It's just that right now we're waiting to go and see changes that are coming up for if California has anything where, you know, if that's going to be a continuation right now. California did remove synthesized cannabinoids from its definition of hemp in 2021, and it outlawed Delta-8 and made production of Delta-9 significantly more costly. So the other thing, too, is that, you know, I would imagine anybody buying Delta-9 right now, they're actually paying more for it because the cost has been passed down to them. But that's interesting that we're going to have that. Is there anything you saw in terms of the study as to why there will be a, is it just more access and it would be... If there was anything about the study where the participants could say, what was it they chose regular Delta 9 over flower? Well, see, you raise another good point. We were also surprised that concentrate would be so popular or vapor pen because it's both are more expensive than flower and concentrates the most expensive of all. Um, so, but the, if, again, we don't, we didn't talk to people. We, we just have to rely on other survey, you know, interviews mostly right. or other experts. Uh, but what they say is that the higher the concentrate, the quicker the high and the more reliable the high. And so, again, I think it's similar to the fact that young people will tend to drink shots of tequila or shots of vodka. Those are much more expensive than beer. Right. But beer takes longer and it seems like it's more expensive because you have to buy more you know to get the same high and so they kind of relate like how much high can i get how many minutes and it seems cheap <laughs> right. They can right get a quick fast reliable high and they could be you know happy and partying the minute they walk in the door to that party practically 
So it's young, older people, again, they tend to drink more wine and beer and low alcohol, whereas young people are taking shots all the time of, you know, very high alcohol content drinks. So it's kind of similar. They're just behaving very similarly. I'm here with Professor Connie Peshman, Professor of Marketing with University of California, Irvine's Paul Mirage School of Business. Stay tuned. We have more Blunt Business coming up after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back to Blunt Business. I'm here with Professor Connie Peshman, Professor of Marketing with University of California, Irvine's Paul Mirage School of Business. And I think one of the things you also that's being brought up in the discussion of the study is the fact that for younger adults, it would be more of a sharing atmosphere. So they're not necessarily consuming it alone. They're obviously with other people. So there could be the, the point of, you know, going together and say if if uh, younger adults considerably buy more flour, they would use it in bongs or joints, and it would be appealing for them because of familiarity, versatility, shareability, lower costs, and rapid and relatively predictive, predictable psychoactive effects. So everyone would get high in the same environment and just it would be in that sociable manner. That would be also consideration. Would you say that would be the same too? Yes. And so we actually found that the number one product that young people use is flour. So they do use flour, number one, just like older adults, but it's just that they use a lot more vapor pen and concentrate. 50% more of their spending is a vapor pen and concentrate than older adults. So that's where the big difference is. Everyone loves flour in California, first and foremost. That's the preferred product. But when you go to number two and number three, uh, you're getting very different pattern from young people and older people. And that's why Headset is one of the only companies I know of, the only one we can find in California, that provided the results Mm -hmm. by age group. So you can see that difference because the people buying their data want to know what are the young people doing, the Gen Z. And and, and it's clear they're behaving differently than older adults. And one of the things when it comes to young adults, you know, that unfortunately you talk about there's a part of what your study does is based on retail cannabis figures. What you can actually have that is illegal cannabis so far. But unfortunately, there is the issue right now that's been documented quite a bit about the illicit market. And in California, in some cases, they're saying it's about up to 40% of the market right now is still illicit. And of course, they've done trying a lot of work to crack down. We've been talking about that since 2018 here on the program. And the same thing goes for... When it comes to illicit program, uh, illicit products that are being put out as children's candy, which was like last month, to be last week, excuse me, as we record this, LA Times reports about the Unified Cannabis Enforcement Task Force. They seized packages in 11 downtown Los Angeles locations, 2.2 million illicit cannabis packages designed to look like candy or sweets. And I don't in Florida we had the same thing here, but there it's obvious. You see, oh look, sweet tarts, but they're done in a cannabis package. Twinkies, but done in a cannabis, but it's actually cannabis infused. All those things that are going on. And it's, you know, that's another thing we're looking at right now, that the illicit market is targeting the younger audience, but at least of what we're seeing that are buying in legal shops, they're buying more organic. They're, you know, we, we get a good understanding of what they're doing and how they're consuming. But with the illicit, we have no clue. Correct. Yeah. So we are currently doing a study on those edible products, um, which flavors appeal to young people, again, young adults, um, what, uh, what, how prevalent is it to use existing brand names like Skittles or Twinkies with a slight wording change? So they're sort of copyright, they're, they are copyright or mm-hmm. trademark violations. Uh, and so that, will I'll come back hopefully and talk to you about that study in several months yeah. once it finally gets through the process. But but even in the legal retail market, we are seeing evidence of these products uh, that are the edible products and the drinks that are looking like neutral consumer products. You have brand names very similar to real brand names uh and 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 it's being sold in the legal market so they're not actually trying to hide it they probably i don't know if it's more so in the illegal market because we just have no handle on the illegal market but even in the legal market we're seeing it yeah 
it's part of those things where I look at this here, and these are opportunists that are doing this. Again, I mean, the, the product, the packaging that said it was priced at $500 of what they were really going to grab. So that's the part where, you know, you, for the the market itself, that continuation for the Bureau of Cannabis Control to do what they can to get law enforcement involved to go and continue to crack down on illicit shops, illicit operations. I mean, I know there's just, it's it's an overwhelming amount and it's it's a, a, a real detriment, but unfortunately that's uh, still something that's going to be dealt with. But you know, hopefully we can get more to a point where the the legal markets can obviously, you know, part of it is too, is it's also a cost question for some of these folks that want to go illicit. The younger demographic will go to illicit if they can go ahead and buy at a cheaper price. But then the quality is going to be compromised because they don't know where they're going to be getting. Exactly. Yes. Young people definitely will go to the illicit market because they, they're very sensitive to price, much more so than older adults. And they're Younger people are also less worried about the risks, like the product quality, which is why we had the vape scare to begin with. So uh, hopefully something can be done to stop the illicit market because it hurts the the legal market and it also hurts research. We, we, can't, we can't get data on the illicit market, so we don't know what's going on. That's scary. Right, right. This is wonderful. I appreciate you coming on and telling us all about this study. And for those that want to go and follow more, real quickly, uh, we want to go and send people over to, again, it's, we want to go and make it a point to direct it, but I'll leave it up to you, the best ways for people to go ahead and reach out and find the study and also keep in, keep engaged with what you're doing at, at UC Irvine. What are the best places to go? So they could just go to the journal called Addiction and look at, you know, look for cannabis and look for UC Irvine and look at this year, which is 2024. It's a, what's called a public access article. Uh, okay. You see uh, the, it's wonderful. The UC system pays the money to the publishers to make it public access. Normally uh, an academic article might cost you $200, $300 right. to read, but UC protects our researchers and then pays that money so that anyone in the general public can go on a website, find the journal addiction, look up cannabis, UC Irvine, and they can find the article. And they Wonderful. can read it for free. So what I'll do is uh, we'll go ahead and make sure to go ahead and link the actual study on uh, the podcast itself so people can go and find it from that way. But now what's the best way to go and connect with your team at UC Irvine so they can follow along with what you're doing, Professor? Well, they could just email me. I'm in the business school. So you All right. email down C Petchman Petchman ah. C P E C H M A N N at U C I dot E D U. Unfortunately, it's only one N. Ah, I saw it on my her too. I thought it was like, why was that? Wow. Yeah, okay. My name is, yeah, my name is two N's, but UC Irvine has a character maximum. <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. So it's only one N. So it's oh, C E C H M A N at U C I dot E D U. Fantastic. Uh, Professor Pe Peshman, thank you for being all this. Really appreciate it. And let's definitely go talk again when you have the next study to go ahead and share with us. Excellent. I'd love to come back. Thank you. And thank you listeners for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time.